Hello guys welcome to my humble YouTube channel where I bring you fanfiction that will brighten your days. Before we start a subscribe is greatly appreciated and don't forget to leave a like and ring the bell icon so you won't miss exciting new fanfiction stories. True God in Another World, Tensura X Tibate, by Tempest underscore King underscore 20. Chapter 24 Reunited Families Rimuru Pav time flew by like crazy. Before we knew it, Arthur had made some serious progress. He finally managed to tap into his first phase, which was pretty awesome. Sure, he couldn't keep it up long enough to use in a fight yet, but hey, baby steps, right? Gramps came through with a neat trick, teaching Arthur how to hide his beast will. Now other mages couldn't sniff him out, which was pretty handy. Plus, this whole assimilation thing let Arthur level up his mana crazy fast. We all busted our butts training, especially with that deviant magic. Arthur even asked me to help him figure out his affinities, which I was totally down for. I'd reached the light yellow stage, while Arthur was in the light red, almost at dark orange, not too shabby. I shared some of my tricks with the gang, Aaliyah, Aya, Gramps, and Tess all picked up, Mana Rotation, and Mirage Walk, from yours truly. Everyone got the hang of it eventually, even Arthur. Poor Tess struggled a bit, but she was getting there. I spent a lot of time working with Aaliyah and Aya, and man, did they get tough. Aya showed me some cool illusion magic, while I tried, and failed, to get plant magic from Aaliyah. Oh, and Sylvie? That little dragon was getting smarter by the day. She was chattering away in almost complete sentences now. Couldn't help but feel like a proud parent watching her grow up. Before we knew it, our four months were almost up. We were all pumped to head to Sapin the next day but King Alduin had other plans. He threw this fancy shindig the night before we left. Royals, nobles, even some nosy elven reporters were all gonna be there. It was one of those swanky affairs where you had to dress up all fancy-like. I strolled into the party, my heart doing a little jig of excitement. The place was absolutely buzzing. The kind of energy you could practically taste. Music flowed through the air, mingling with the hum of a hundred conversations. The hall was decked out to the nines, with these massive chandeliers throwing off a soft, golden glow. They dimmed the lights just right, giving everything this warm, cozy vibe that made you want to sink right in. In the corner, a jazz band was laying down some seriously smooth tunes. Their saxophonist was really feeling it, swaying with eyes closed as he played. Folks were nodding along, some even doing a little two-step as they chatted. I spotted Gramps waving me over. His face lit up like a kid on Christmas morning. Yo, Ree, over here, kiddo. He shouted, his voice barely carrying over the lively chatter. I weaved through the crowd, dodging a waiter with a tray full of fancy looking snacks. Alduin's eyes twinkled with genuine joy as he slid a drink my way. Look who finally showed up, he said, his tone warm and welcoming. I could tell he was just as excited as Gramps, even if he was playing it cool. I plopped down next to Gramps, who was nursing what looked like his second glass of wine. His cheeks were a bit flushed, whether from the alcohol or sheer happiness, I couldn't tell. Thanks for the bash, guys, I said, trying to keep my voice steady despite the lump of emotion forming in my throat. This is pretty sweet. Alduin chuckled, his eyes twinkling with amusement. Don't mention it, Re. It's the least we could do for our savior and helper of our race. Muriel's expression was so full of fondness it made my heart ache a little. You will always hold a special place in our hearts, Re, she said softly, her words nearly drowned out by the swell of music. And we will always be here for you whenever you need us. Gramps nodded, his eyes brimming with pride and affection. Indeed, Re, you have come a long way since you first arrived here, and I do not doubt that you will continue to grow stronger and make us proud. Thank you, Gramps. Thank you, Alduin. Thank you, Muriel. I will never forget all that you have done for me, I said. We shared a moment of silence, lost in our thoughts, before Gramps cleared his throat and broke the quietness. Well then, let's not dwell on our goodbyes just yet. We still have a night of fun and celebration ahead of us. Alduin and Muriel both smiled at Gramps' words, and I couldn't help but feel my spirits lifting. They were right, there was no point in dwelling on our goodbyes not when we still had a night of fun and celebration ahead of us. I turned my attention towards the drinks on the table, and to my disappointment I was given fresh juices instead of alcohol. 
Tu glanced up at Gramps who had a mischievous smile on his face as he enjoyed a glass of fine wine. He knew me too well, always trying to tease me about being too young to drink. Feeling defeated, I picked up the glass of juice in front of me and took a sip. I thought I was being sneaky, trying to snag a bottle of booze without anyone noticing. But nope, Seal caught me red-handed. Less than less than you shouldn't drink alcohol, M-A. S. T. E. R. Greater than greater than Seal said sharply that look that made me feel like a kid caught with their hand in the cookie jar. I couldn't help but shiver a bit. Greater than greater than high less than less than I sighed, waving goodbye to my dreams of tasting this world's liquor. For now, anyway, there's always next time, right? After a while, Art and Tess arrived. Arthur was dressed in a navy blue suit that matched his azure eyes perfectly. The suit had a crisp, white button-up shirt tucked into navy blue dress pants that were tailored to fit him just right. His auburn brown hair was neatly combed over to the side, looking as though he had just come from the barbershop. And Tess arrived in a flowing ivory dress that reached her ankles, featuring a delicate lace overlay on the bodice and hemline. The dress was cinched at the waist with a golden belt, with a small, intricate flower at the center. Her long gunmetal gray hair was brushed to perfection, held together with a golden ribbon that matched her belt. And I could see the joy on their faces as they entered the hall. Tess. Art. I called out, waving them over to our table. Their faces lit up when they spotted us, and they quickly made their way over, after greetings, they sat down in their seats. Fast forward a couple of hours, and Alduin decides it's speech time. He gets up, grabs his glass, and does that fancy tap-tap thing with his spoon. Everyone shuts up real quick. As you may know, both of these boys have been in our kingdom for about three years, and they were the first human beings to set foot in our kingdom in more than a hundred years. And in that time both of them were able to show how not all humans are what we imagine, I'm sure that there are still many who think about the war between us and humans a hundred years ago, and there are still many scars that cannot be erased. Alduin paused and looked around the room, taking in the expressions of the audience. There were some who looked skeptical, but most seemed to be listening with open minds. But these boys showed us a different side of humanity. They showed us compassion, kindness, and courage. They risked their lives to save one of our own, and in doing so, they helped us save thousands more. They did it without asking for anything in return, without expecting any reward or recognition. Alduin's tone was heartfelt and there was a quiet respect that had settled over the room. It was clear that Alduin held a deep admiration for my brother and me. I hope that their presence in our kingdom has been a reminder that there is always hope for change, and that not all humans wish us harm. They have shown us that it is possible to move beyond the past, to find common ground, and build a better future for all. The room fell into contemplative silence as Alduin's words sank in. There was still much work to be done, and much healing to take place but it was clear that progress had been made. There was a feeling of unity and hope that permeated the room, and it seemed as though anything was possible. As they prepare to leave our kingdom, I want to thank them for all that they have done. They have made a lasting impact on the lives of so many, and they will always be remembered here. We will always welcome them back as friends and guests. I'm sure there are people now confused but something has not been made public. Days before their arrival, about three years ago, my daughter, Tessia Erelith, was kidnapped, a collective gasp went up from the assembly, and murmurs of shock and surprise rippled through the crowd. The news was a well-kept secret until now. No one suspected the beloved princess had been taken. And as we began to give up hope of ever finding her, Alduin continued, his voice heavy with emotion, these two young people under the age of five who were surviving in the forest after being separated from their parents, found my daughter and rescued her from the kidnappers. We owe them a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid, Alduin said, his voice filled with emotion. Because of their heroic actions, my daughter Tessia is here with us today, safe and sound. We are eternally grateful for their courage and selflessness. And when we wanted to give them a reward, all they asked for was a way to get home safely, and now we can give them this simple reward, to save my daughter. Their actions saved my daughter's life and brought her back to us. They were not born of this land but they have certainly earned their place amongst us," Alduin continued, his voice clear and strong. But that wasn't all they did. While Arthur was taking care of my daughter, Rimuru found a notebook of the hideouts of the Slavers. He picked up the old notebook I gave him the day we arrived. I'm sure everyone now understands what's going on. I'm sure you've heard about the rescues you're taking in. 
the past three years and it's all thanks to Rimuru's sharpness who found this notebook and because of it we've been able to save at least 5,000 elves. I repeat, this boy, Arthur Lewin, rescued my daughter, and his brother, Rimuru Lewin, did an action that resulted in us rescuing 5,000 of our race, Alduin declared, his voice firm and proud. With things more simplified, small claps began to be heard, which soon grew by all the nobles there, clapping as they looked at my brother and me standing. As the claps and cheers died down, Alduin stepped forward once more. And so, it is with great honor that I offer both Arthur and Rimuru Lewin the Order of the Kingdom of Eleanor Platinum, he announced, a smile spreading across his face. Butlers were coming to us with two boxes, one for each, and they opened them. Inside those boxes were medals, they showed our importance and status as heroes, as mentioned before. The king personally put the medals on our clothes, it was a silver one with a symbol of leaves, branches and a shield in the center. But that's not all, Alduin said, his voice ringing with excitement. Rimuru, for your incredible efforts in finding the slavers' hideouts, we have a special award for you. He gestured to another butler, who stepped forward with a small golden badge. This badge signifies that even if you aren't an elf or from our royalty, you can be considered our royal representative outside our immense forest. You have proven that you are worthy of this honor, and we are proud to have you as our ambassador. As Arthur and I looked at each other, surprised by this offer, we both nodded our heads, accepting the honor with gratitude. The nobles around us erupted in applause once more, as the two of us were officially welcomed into this kingdom, admired and celebrated for our bravery and heroism. After completing our honoring, Alduin also started honoring the people who also contributed to the rescue operations, and certainly, Aaliyah and Aya were among them. With huge smiles on their face, Alduin and Muriel shouted, Let the party begin. With this many couples took to the dance floor as others started animatedly chatting in groups. While some nobles gathered around me and my brother who wanted to speak with us. Using the magic of illusion, I escaped to an open balcony, once I stepped out onto the balcony. The cool night air embraced us, offering a refreshing respite from the bustling party inside. The moonlight cast an ethereal glow upon the meticulously manicured gardens below, accentuating the vibrant hues of the blooming flowers. The mesmerizing fragrance of the blooms permeated the air, creating a heady atmosphere of tranquility and beauty. As I leaned against the balcony railing, taking in the picturesque view, I felt a sense of calm wash over me. The distant laughter and lively music from the grand ballroom below created a festive atmosphere, reminding me of the joyous celebration happening inside. Suddenly, I heard a familiar voice behind me, filled with excitement. There you are, Rimuru! Aya exclaimed, her face beaming with a wide grin. We've been looking all over for you. Aaliyah nodded in agreement, a warm smile spreading across her face. We wanted to come out here and personally congratulate you and Arthur on your well-deserved honors, she said, her eyes sparkling with admiration. I turned around and greeted them with a relaxed smile. Thanks, Aya, Aaliyah. You both played a big role in this too, you know. I couldn't have done it without your help. Aya chuckled, oh, we were just doing our part. But really, it's still hard to believe you accomplished all this at the tender age of four. I can't wait to see what you'll do in the future. Aaliyah nodded in agreement, a playful glint in her eye. Absolutely. The fun we've had together will be etched in our memories forever. It's been like having a little brother, and we're going to miss that. I smiled and nodded, reminiscing about our carefree days of pranks, outings, and training sessions. I know what you mean. Being with you too has felt like a part of a family. I'm really going to miss that. Aya draped an arm around my shoulder, her tone light and casual. Ah, don't be so down about it. We may be going our separate ways, but you know we'll always be here for you, little brother. Aaliyah joined in, giving me a gentle nudge. Exactly. And who knows, maybe our paths will cross again someday. In the meantime, enjoy your next adventure, alright? We shared a comfortable moment, the three of us leaning against the balcony and taking in the festive atmosphere. It was a bittersweet feeling, knowing our time together was coming to an end, but the memories would forever be cherished. I woke up the next day feeling stiff and groggy, my body still tired from the excitement and adrenaline rush of the previous day. I stretched my arms and legs, feeling a satisfying pop in my joints. After a quick shower, I put on a simple outfit and grabbed my bag, put all my belongings into my dimensional ring. I then headed to Art's room with Sylvie on my head, until he came out and we walked towards the castle entrance. 
We were stopped by some maids along the way who handed us cups of tea and a small piece of bread with a nice smile on their face. I think it was because we needed to go there as soon as possible, it was even good to think that the first real meal of the day would be with our family. Finally at the entrance we delivered the cups to the employees who opened the doors for us and we saw that there were two carriages, one more chic and elegant that was from the royal family and another that was from the elf representatives, even though yesterday I became an elven representative too, this happened well after they signed the roles of Zyrus's visitors, that is, I would not be obliged to follow the journey with them to the famous academy. We spotted Mariel and Alduin near an ornate carriage, its gold filigree catching the sun's rays. Gramps stood a short distance away, his eyes crinkling as he smiled at us. Before I could even open my mouth to greet him, I heard the rapid patter of footsteps. Rimuru. Aya and Aaliyah cried out in unison, their voices full of emotion as they crashed into me, wrapping me in a fierce hug. Please promise us to be safe, they pleaded, their words muffled against my chest. I gently patted their backs, trying to keep my balance. You both know I can't make that promise, I said softly but I'll promise to try my best to stay alive. Suddenly, I felt sharp pinches on both sides of my waist. Ow, I yelped, caught off guard. Their embrace tightened, and I started to struggle for air. Aya, Aaliyah, please, I wheezed. I can't breathe. Oh, don't be such a baby, Aya teased, her voice thick with unshed tears. This will be the last time we see you for a while. They loosened their grip slightly but didn't let go. After a moment, I hugged them back just as fiercely. We'll meet again, Aaliyah, Aya, I murmured, planting a quick kiss on each of their cheeks. Their faces flushed pink, and I couldn't help but grin. What? You should be used to this by now. They didn't respond, instead moving to hug Arthur. Aya's voice carried a hint of worry as she said, We'll miss you too, Art. Watch your brother so he doesn't do something crazy. Hey, I protested, but Arthur just laughed. Of course, he assured them, his voice warm. I'll miss you too, big sisters. They parted after a while and Sylvie jumped again on my head after I barely escaped from that suffocating embrace, and we walked to Gramps and next to him was Tess who came running towards us, and hugged us tightly. As they parted, Sylvie took the opportunity to leap onto my head, nearly knocking me off balance. We made our way to Gramps, and I noticed Tess rushing towards us, her eyes shining with unshed tears. I'm going to miss you two so much, she exclaimed, pulling us into a tight hug. As she stepped back, I said with a small smile, don't worry, I'm sure we'll meet at the academy. I overheard Gramps talking to the director about it. Arthur nodded, his voice reassuring. Right, and we can always use the communication scroll. Or I can use the teleportation gate to visit you. Gramps cleared his throat, his deep voice tinged with emotion. While Alduin and Mariel will be traveling in a separate carriage as the heads of the kingdom, Tess and I won't be going. This will be the last time we'll see each other for now. He paused, then added with a hint of his usual humor, until next time, Arthur. Rimuru. Before we knew it, he had us in a bare hug that nearly sent Sylvie tumbling from her perch. With final goodbyes said to the royal family, we climbed into the simplest of the carriages. As we settled in, I noticed other elves boarding nearby carriages. One face stood out, someone I recognized immediately. Hey, Feifi, how have you been? I saw you at the party yesterday, but I couldn't find you to catch up, I said. Feifi turned, his pointy ears perking up at the sound of his name. His emerald eyes sparkled with excitement as he spotted us. Arthur, sitting beside me, perked up at the mention of Feifi's name. Oh yeah, I remember him, he murmured, a hint of recognition in his voice. Oh, no problem no problem, now with you guys having won such important things, we're on the same level, and that makes us rivals, he said excitedly and with a proud face. But what's up? Feifi continued, leaning against our carriage door, I heard you're finally going to go back to your families. I don't know what it would have been like if I had gone through something like this, being separated from my parents. Yes, you really couldn't take it, that was my thought, before we were warned that the carriage was going to start moving. Soon after out carriage passed through the teleportation gate and we were welcomed by the familiar feeling of teleportation. Arthur Pov. We have arrived at Zyrus, the driver announced to us. I leaned out the window, taking in the bustling city scene. Zyrus was a sprawling metropolis, its skyline dotted with towers of varying heights and architectural styles. 
The streets were paved with smooth cobblestones, lined with colorful shops and busy market stalls. A sea of people had gathered to welcome the tournament participants, their excited chatter filling the air. Our driver expertly maneuvered the carriage away from the main streets, pulling into a narrow alley between two tall brick buildings. The sounds of the crowd faded, replaced by the echo of horse hooves on stone. This is your stop, the driver said in a low voice. You can slip out unnoticed here. Re turned to our fellow passengers, his voice warm but tinged with a hint of sadness. Well, this is where we part ways. It's been a pleasure chatting with all of you. Fei-Fi, everyone, best of luck in the tournament. Fei-Fi replied, Thanks, Ri, it was great meeting you too. Maybe we'll see each other around the city? We all exchanged farewells, bowing slightly to each other before hopping off the carriage. As we started down the alley, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and anxiety about what lay ahead. The alley opened up into a quieter street, lined with elegant townhouses. Ri led the way, Sylvie still perched on his head like a living hat. After a short walk, we arrived at a grand manor house. Its facade was adorned with intricate stonework, and a well-manicured garden stretched out front. As we climbed the steps, I felt my heart racing, I wiped my sweaty palms on my pants and took a deep breath. Ri must have noticed my nervousness because he turned to me with a reassuring smile. Hey, relax. I know it's a bit overwhelming, but trust me, everything will be fine. The heavy wooden door creaked open, and Ri's cheerful voice echoed through the grand entrance hall. Hello, we're back. I stepped inside, my eyes widening as I took in the manor's interior. The entrance hall was enormous, with a ceiling so high it made me feel tiny. A grand staircase dominated the space, its dark wood banister gleaming with fresh polish. The walls were adorned with paintings in ornate gold frames and rich tapestries that looked like they cost more than most people's houses. Suddenly, the patter of small feet broke the silence. Brudder! A high-pitched voice squealed the word echoing off the marble floors. I turned to see a little girl racing towards us, her face lit up with pure joy, her hair, the same shade as my father's but softer and more lustrous, bounced in two cute pigtails above her ears. This must be Eleanor, I realized, my heart twisting with a mix of love and regret for the years I'd missed. Rimuru scooped her up into his arms and twirled her around as she giggled gleefully. Hi Ellie, did you miss your big brother? He asked ruffling her hair affectionately. Ellie nodded enthusiastically. Aha, uh -huh. did you bring me a present? Re laughed. Maybe. But first, there's someone I want you to meet. That's when I heard my mother's voice. Rimuru, you're finally back. She appeared at the top of the stairs, freezing mid-sentence as her eyes landed on me. The world seemed to stand still for a moment. I struggled to peel my eyes away from Ellie and turned to face my mother. My vision got blurry as tears started flowing through my eyes. The dam I built, slowly breaking. I said one thing I knew she was waiting to hear. H hi mom. I'm home. I gestured a small, awkward wave, with a smile. Tears flowed through my eyes. Oh, my baby. Arthur, she cried out, gripping me with all her strength. Tears started streaming down my cheeks as I buried my head in her shoulders, my entire body shaking with sobs. I tried holding back my sobs but failed. The dam which was already breaking collapsed and I started crying. I buried my head in my mother's shoulders and cried, I cried like the child I was on the outside. Although we had kept in touch through the communication scroll, seeing my mother in person felt incredibly different. The warmth of her embrace, the sound of her voice and the gentle scent of her perfume were intensely familiar and comforting. I cried uncontrollably, letting go of all the pent-up emotions that had been weighing me down. Arthur. I turned my head towards the sound of my father's voice, and my heart swelled with emotion as I saw him running towards us, drenched in sweat. The sight of him rushing towards me caused more tears to flow down my face. He didn't stop as he reached us, sliding down onto his knees and pulling all of us into a tight hug. We all held onto one another, shaking with sobs and overpowering emotions. From the side of my eye, I saw Rimuru looking at us with a serene smile his eyes glistening with tears as he joined us in our embrace. Our little family reunion continued. My mother sobbing uncontrollably, embracing me, and Ellie that didn't understand what was going on but she was with us in the hug, and Ri who was just smiling without saying anything, as my father and I just looked at each other with tears in our eyes, all of us glad that we were finally together.
We all settled into the living room, the air thick with a mix of joy and apprehension. I sank into the softness of the couch, my heart racing as mom sat beside me. Her eyes were red rimmed, a testament to countless sleepless nights. Eleanor, my new little sister, squirmed on mom's lap, her innocent curiosity a stark contrast to the heavy atmosphere. Dad pulled up a chair, the legs scraping against the floor, breaking the silence. He leaned forward, his weathered hands clasped tightly. I could see the mix of relief and worry etched on his face. It's been too long, Arthur, Dad said, his voice rough with emotion. We've missed you something fierce. Every day, we'd wake up hoping. Hoping this nightmare would end, Mom finished, her voice barely above a whisper. Fresh tears welled up in her eyes as she reached out to touch my face, as if making sure I was really there. I swallowed hard, trying to keep my own emotions in check. I'm so sorry, I managed, my voice cracking. I never meant to put you through all this. Mom squeezed my hand, her touch warm and comforting. Oh, sweetie, don't apologize. We're just over the moon you're back safe. It's been. Well, it's been tough without you. But you're home now, and that's all that matters. I nodded, unable to speak past the lump in my throat. The weight of their love and worry was almost overwhelming. After a moment, Mom turned to Eleanor, her voice brightening. Ellie, honey, say hi to your big brother. Remember how we talked about Arthur? He's been away, but now he'll be living with us. Go on, say hello. Eleanor's eyes widened with excitement. Hi, brooder, she chirped, waving her tiny hands enthusiastically. I couldn't help but laugh, feeling a spark of joy cut through the tension. Hello, Eleanor. It's great to finally meet you. Little sister. I reached out to pat her head, and she giggled with delight, her innocent happiness infectious. Dad cleared his throat, his expression turning serious. Rimaru's filled us in a bit, but, well, we'd like to hear it from you, son. What's the real story with this, disease, you had? We've been worried sick, imagining all sorts of things. I glanced at Rimaru, who suddenly found the ceiling very interesting, with a sigh, I knew it was time for the truth. It wasn't exactly a disease, it was. A beast's will. Mom gasped, her hand flying to her mouth. A beast's will? But that would mean. Her voice trailed off, the implications sinking in. Yeah, I nodded, feeling a mix of pride and fear. I'm a beast tamer. But listen, this needs to stay between us. Okay. Only Rimuru, the Aerolith Royals. A couple of elves we trust, and now you guys know. We need to keep it under wraps until we're strong enough to protect everyone. Of course, dear, Mom agreed quickly, her eyes wide with a mix of awe and concern. We understand. What about this little friend of yours? My father chuckled, his eyes twinkling with curiosity as he finally brought up Sylvie. He leaned forward in his chair, elbows on his knees, clearly intrigued. Re shifted in his seat, a fond smile playing on his lips. Well, it's quite a story, actually. While we were traveling, we stumbled upon a mana beast that was badly hurt. The poor thing was crying out for help, and I couldn't just ignore it. Always the softy, aren't you? Dad teased, earning a playful eye roll from Re. Anyway, Re continued, when I got closer, I realized this mana beast was incredibly docile. It, it gave me this strange stone with its tail before it died. His voice softened, a hint of sadness creeping in. We had no idea it was an egg at the time. Mom gasped softly, her hand flying to her mouth. Oh, you poor dears. That must have been awful to witness. Re nodded, then brightened up. But here's the amazing part. She hatched only four months ago. She's still just a baby. He grinned, gesturing to Sylvie. Say hi to everyone, Sylvie. Rimuru scooped up Sylvie, holding her so her limbs dangled adorably, like a kitten's. Q, Sylvie purred, her big eyes scanning the room as if to greet each person individually. Ellie clapped her hands in delight. So cute, she squealed, making everyone laugh. Eager to change the subject before Dad could start interrogating us about mana beasts, I turned to him. In any case, what stage are you at now, Dad? Dad's chest puffed up like a proud rooster. Ah, oh, your old man's been working hard, you know. Finally broke through two years back. He paused dramatically. I'm at the solid orange stage now. Close to breaking through to light orange, even. I couldn't hide my surprise, my eyebrows shooting up. Wow, Dad, that's impressive. 
At just over 30, our dad was doing exceptionally well. Most ordinary mages like us, without access to fancy schools, usually got stuck in the light red stage, or maybe dark orange if they were lucky. Mom beamed at dad, reaching over to squeeze his hand. He's been working so hard, Arthur. You should see him training every morning. Rain or shine, he's out there. Ah, come on, Alice, dad said, a hint of a blush on his cheeks. You're making me sound like some kind of hero. You are to me, mom replied softly, and for a moment, they just gazed at each other, lost in their own world. Re cleared his throat, breaking the moment. So, uh, what about you two? Dad asked, his expression turning curious. How far along are you boys? I hesitated, glancing at Ree. He nodded slightly, then quickly moved to cover Ellie's ears. I took a deep breath. L light red, I admitted, bracing for the reaction. The room went silent for a beat, then Dad's eyes widened to saucers. E-H? Light red? Holy she? Ray. Mom cut in sharply, dark energy practically radiating from her glare. Dad gulped, suddenly looking very small. I mean, holy moly, he corrected weakly, shrinking under Mom's continued glare. Thank goodness Rimuru knows how to keep Ellie safe, Mom sighed, shaking her head. Really, dear, you need to watch your language. Dad nodded vigorously, still avoiding Mom's eyes. Right, right, sorry, dear, won't happen again. Re, still covering Ellie's ears, couldn't help but smirk. His eyes danced with amusement as he looked at our dad. Really, dad? Even after finding out about my base stage, you were still taken aback by Arthur's? Dad had the grace to look sheepish, rubbing the back of his neck. His cheeks flushed a bit, embarrassed at his overreaction. Well, you can't blame me for being surprised. My boys, advancing so quickly. His voice trailed off a mix of pride and concern in his eyes. He leaned forward, curiosity sparkling in his eyes. Say, Re, what stage are you at now? Last I remember, you were. Re cut him off, trying to sound casual, light yellow. The room fell silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Mom's eyes widened, and Dad's jaw practically hit the floor. Even Ellie, who didn't really understand what was going on, seemed to sense the tension in the room. After what felt like an eternity, Dad broke the silence with a booming laugh that seemed to shake the whole house. My sons are still the same geniuses they used to be. He stood up, his eyes twinkling with excitement and pride. Come on, let's have a quick spar with your old man. He grinned menacingly while clasping our shoulders, his grip firm and challenging. Mom immediately jumped up, her protective instincts kicking in. Dear, they just got home, she pulled me back her hand warm and comforting on my arm. Let them rest, for goodness sake. I turned to mom, seeing the worry in her eyes. Gently, I placed my hand on top of hers, giving her a reassuring smile. It's fine, mom. Really? We could use a little exercise after the long journey. Mom sighed, shaking her head helplessly. She looked down at Ellie, who was watching the whole scene with wide, curious eyes. Men, always trying to fight, isn't that right? Ellie? Ellie, eager to be part of the conversation, puffed out her little chest and declared, Papa and brothers are men. She tried to mimic our mother's exasperated expression, but it came out more like an adorable pout, making us all chuckle. We all laughed, the tension breaking. As we started towards the door, Dad already bragging about moves he was going to show us, we heard a loud bang. The living room doors flew open, and there stood our family's benefactors.